You've said you've written everything you possibly can for money. I'm curious, what's the difference between writing for money and not writing for money? Well, uh, that's a great question. The difference between writing for money and not writing for money uh, is more than just being a mercenary. I'm a working writer, which means I make a living or have made a living for 45 years writing. Uh, other than teaching, I, haven't, I don't have a day job. I never have uh, since I sold my first script. So uh, I have to write what sells. I have to write what people are paying money for. So that means I'm often writing something that isn't my first choice. I spent the last 20 years to a large degree writing uh, children's animation. Well, I wouldn't have chosen to write children's animation, but it's what was paying. So I learned how to do it and I, I've enjoyed it and have done some very good work doing that. So that's one distinction is I'm not all, f I write my own projects separately, not for money. You know, I'll write spec scripts, continue to do it, always have. Sometimes they sell, sometimes they don't. Probably more often than not, uh, spec scripts don't sell, but uh, that's me. That's me putting my best work uh, uh, into the world. But when I write for money, uh, I'm trying to execute someone else's vision as well as I possibly can. Um, that's the one distinction, but it's not quite as cold-blooded as all that. Because when you write for money, that means you're writing for a form that the producer thinks will get that money back, the money he's put into it, plus more, plus a profit. By definition, that means you're writing for an audience. There have to be people out there who are going to watch this. And that's great training because left to their own devices, all writers are going to tend to get lost in their own head and just write what they want to write. And that's fine. But they often disconnect from the audience. If you haven't had the experience of watching uh, an audience see your work, I've been lucky enough to have that experience hundreds of times. And it's been good for me to see what audiences like, what the audiences don't like, what they respond to, what they don't respond to, how they respond uh, is great training. And I wish every writer could have that experience. I have friends who are major screenwriters, but they may have only had four or five movies made in their entire in 20, 30 years. And even then, very often, it wasn't really their movie. Somebody rewrote it or the director changed it. And, they, and so the, they have a limited uh, amount of experience seeing an audience respond to their work. And what, because I have had that experience, because I've written for money on TV shows or TV movies or movie movies, uh, but because audiences responded to it and I was in my job, my paycheck depended on me uh, satisfying those audiences. Uh, because of that, I've been more in touch with the audience <clears throat> than I usually, than, than most, uh, most screenwriters probably are. I'm curious, do you recall any interesting sort of conversations where you've actually sat in and heard a positive and negative and how that changed you or affected uh, further storytelling? Positive and ne negative from the audience, you mean? Right, right, if you've been uh, sort of well, a fly on the wall. If, yeah, for sure, in terms of, uh, I did spend much of my career, early in my career, it's about 20 years, uh, doing uh, multi-camera sitcoms. And uh, I don't know if that's, a, common term everybody knows, but multi-camera sitcoms are shot with four cameras on a sound stage, like Friends or Frasier, Everybody Loves Raymond, that kind of thing. And there's an audience behind those cameras responding to the scenes as if they were a play. They're performed like a play, scene by scene. Well, because of that, 20 years, 22 episodes of a season, that's a lot of episodes that I either wrote or co-wrote or worked on seeing an audience respond. And so, especially in comedy, what you're looking for is that verbal reaction, a laugh. If you get a laugh, it's great. If you don't, it's usually not good. Uh, so in terms of that, very often, I'm constantly adjusting. We might adjust between takes very often when a, a typical multi-camera sitcom, you do two takes, usually sometimes three, but usually two takes of a scene. And even in the five, 10 minutes between each take when the actors are being touched up for their makeup and their cameras are going back to position one, uh, the, the writers and producers are rushing in to try and fix the joke or tweak this or make it work better. So it was a constant process. Uh, and I also learned that laughter isn't the only way to read an audience, that uh, I had, had a boss once who said, you know, all I want in that first scene, I'd love to have a laugh in the first scene, 
But if I just get a, a gasp or a moan or something that suggests they're engaged in the story, we're gold. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for, are they engaged in the story? Are they leaning in? Are they interested in whatever the protagonist's problem is? And so it could come in the form of a laugh, but any kind of response like that is more useful. Uh, the, it's the most useful thing any writer can have, a dramatic writer. Uh, much more useful than a focus group, for example, where focus groups of any kind are false there because they're asking people to put into uh, verbal responses what they felt. And the average audience member is not capable of doing that. There's no reason to expect them to be able to do that. It's hard for anybody to be able to say what it was they felt half an hour ago when they watched something. Uh, they just can't do it, and it's usually not very useful. Watching them live is the best. Andy, you recently started a YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. it's The Go Draft by Andy Gerdot. Um, you say the world doesn't need more screenwriters, it needs better movies? Yeah, that's part of my philosophy for doing it in the first place. I'm not selling a book, I'm not selling a seat in a seminar. I just want to see better movies. I, I, I'm a bit of an old grouch, I guess, but I don't think I'm alone in saying that there aren't a lot of great movies anymore. We're lucky to see one a year, literally one good movie a year, uh, much less the barrage of great films that uh, I grew up watching in the, in the 70s, especially when I came of age as a, as a film watcher and fell in love with films. Every week, there'd be two or three great films released, and now it's, there's a paucity. There's a, just a lack of, uh, of good stuff movies because I believe the craft of screenwriting has fallen to such a low level. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons for it. It doesn't really matter why, but um, my goal here is just to share what I know, and I have learned a lot over 45 years of getting paid to do this. I have learned a lot about how to tell stories in the filmic medium. So uh, that's my goal. I just want to share it. And, and I had taught, <coughs> have taught for a number of years, at UCLA and at Pepperdine Universities. But I uh, also, when I was working uh, up until recently, I, I still do go in as a consultant at uh, Disney still, but up until recently, I was a day-to-day -day television writer and a head writer. And so I was found myself teaching writing to the staffs who were desperate for this material, even though most of them had been to film school. The screenwriting instruction they'd received was not particularly good. So, um, or at least it wasn't useful to them. And so I realized there was, a, there was a market for this. I'm not interested in try at this point in my career. I'm comfortable, I don't need to monetize it. I just wanna uh, share it. And, and if it's a value to someone, it seems to be to a lot of people what I know, um, why not get it out there in the world? And that's what the, that's what the go draft is all about. Uh, the term go draft, by the way, because people ask me, what does that mean? It used to be common in, uh, in Hollywood. I don't know if it is anymore, but uh, they talked about the go draft was the draft that was written that got the green light. Whoever wrote the go draft was a prized commodity. S very often they weren't even credited, uh, but they, they did that last pass that made the, the, made the script go from promising to, okay, let's start writing checks. We're going to make this film. And uh, that's a lot of who I'm writing it for, are people who are probably already interested or even actively trying to be a writer. A screenwriter, but their work isn't quite up to the level of getting shot, of getting paid, of getting, you know, moving on to the next level of getting your work produced. And so that's hence the go draft. Going back to the idea of uh, maybe there's less quality films made today, do you think that we watch films for different reasons? Sometimes we have things playing in the background that we're not too emotionally invested in. It's pretty light, it's pretty, maybe the people are pretty. And others we go by ourselves and we maybe we're not in the best mood, but we want to feel something to take us out of where we are. And other people want to be sort of, it's a date movie, they don't want anything too serious. We go for different reasons. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I think it's probably always been true. I mean, I don't, there were, you know, when you look back at the history of Hollywood movies, there were romantic comedies and musicals and dramas and, uh, film noir and all kinds of things. So uh, the difference is, especially in the last, well, since streaming especially, um, <clears throat> even before that, the fragmentation of the market through cable. But the, as more and more people began to experience uh, two-hour films, feature-length films, 
uh, at home rather than in the theater, uh, it forces the screenwriter to capture the audience quicker. We don't have as much time as we used to. I think Robert Town used to talk about you had 10, 15 minutes before anybody was going to start talking about leaving. So you've got him for a, well, that's not true anymore. You don't have him for 10 or 15 seconds anymore. You have to capture people more quickly. Uh, and that's true. But that's not the, certainly not the reason why uh, <clears throat> the craft has, has uh, gotten as uh, sloppy and ragged as it has. Um, most films that don't work, the vast majority of them, don't work because of the script, because no, this, they never got the story right. Or maybe they did get the story right, but then producers and stars and other directors started monkeying with it and pulled it out of shape. Very rarely are, um, are films failures because they're poorly directed or because it's not shot well or because uh, the costumes are wrong or even if the casting is wrong. It certainly can affect how effective they are. But that's not usually the reason why a film fails. It's almost always the problems are in the script.